And I asked them, I said, let me ask you a question. How do you guys get paid? And they were like, oh, you know, what, that's obnoxious. I'm like, no, I'm not asking you how much money you make. I'm asking you, what's your incentive, right? Go back to Charlie Munger. Show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. How do you get paid? Well, what do you mean? They, they, they didn't even resonate. What do you mean, how do we get paid? I said, if you had a really ambitious fuel buyer that did their own supply demand work and came to you and said, prices are 20 bucks. We need to buy all the uranium we can because they need to get to in the 60s. Would you buy all the uranium you can and do they get compensated? And is it part of your compensation? Are you bonus for that? And they looked at me like I had three eyeballs. They said, what are you talking about? We're, we're paid to, 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 to buy uranium. Whatever the price is, we're going to pay. Mike, welcome to the show. And thank you for making some time. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Right on. So we've had uh, Doomberg on the podcast and Mark Nelson, who are both proponents of nuclear energy. Yeah. But we've never had somebody to actually unpack the investment thesis around nuclear, aka uranium. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into that, could you give us a bit of background of what you're up to over at Santrum Cove Partners? Sure. Yeah. Background wise, I've, I've been in the hedge fund industry since the middle of the latter part of the 90s. Um, my first several years, I was a short seller. So I was uh, looking for uh, companies that we thought would stumble, companies led by bad management teams, companies led by shady management teams, you name it. Um, so uh, did that for a number of years. Uh, then throughout my, the, the rise of my career, did, then became a partner at a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, was there for a, a long time. Uh, retired in 2015 um, when my, my daughter was ill. She's okay now, but I just decided it was time to hang up the spreadsheets. Um, and uh, when I was home, I had some a lot of spare time and I started looking at nuclear power. My, my career has been on the long side, investing, owning stocks, not when, I'm not when I wasn't shorting them, was in very deeply cyclical and deep value situations. So looking for things that most others hate. And uh, if I if I talked to somebody about whatever I was looking at and, and they liked it, I probably was, probably wasn't for me. Uh, so these were things that people were running out of the building and out of the fire. And um, so nuclear fit that description, had looked at it a couple of times. In the um, middle part of two, 2007, when it was at its peak, 2011 after Fukushima and both times, we just kind of, kind of didn't do anything with it, didn't spend enough time, we had other stuff going on. But with the benefit of time and having just uh, not having a, a, a p l that I was running for other people, having responsibilities like that, I had the time to be able to, to dig in. And uh, so in 2016, I really started spending a lot of time trying to understand nuclear. And uh, it, it was a commodity that fit the bill potentially of something that might be interesting where the commodity was down 90% post the event in March of 2011 in Fukushima, where the, the reactor melted down. So a few years later, the commodity gets hammered. The number of companies doing it went from, I don't know, 500 down to 50 something. And um, there were, it was carnage. Uh, most of the investment banks that had research on it, um, there, those analysts were not there anymore. The physical trading desks that traded the commodity had left the business. So it was really an abandoned industry. And I had very very uh, average to below average knowledge of nuclear power. I just had a very mild understanding of it. So I, I said, let me come at this through the eyes of a short seller. Let, let me let me try and break the case for nuclear power. First, let me learn what it is. But that's what I did. And, you know, I could take you through that. But it was over a couple of years of building, building out my own model on demand and going to, to nuclear industry events away from Wall Street and um, just talking to people who bought the, the fuel um, and people who sold the fuel and people who made the, the uh, or produced the uranium, um, trying to understand the demand side and the supply side, building models for both sides, uh, being very draconian on demand, meaning at that time, back in 2016 and 17, nuclear was not a real growth story. It had a very small amount of growth the top five producing countries of nuclear, uh, uh, the US, South Korea, Japan, the French, um, their policies were to wean themselves off of, if not totally, but to reduce their dependency on nuclear power. So mm -hmm. 
when I was modeling this out, I took all of that into account. But even then, there was still a modicum of growth. Uh, and then it was just modeling out the supply side and the cost curve. And again, when you find industries where professional investors have left the building, uh, there's no one there, the investment banks aren't writing research. And by the way, not that professional investors get it right. A lot don't, we, we get it wrong a lot. But but at least with, with a, a, a analytical eye towards it, when there was no one there, it just kind of drifts and it's just kind of there. And so uh, looking at the cost curves, many of them were dated. Uh, they, they were using uh, the C1 cash cost for, for these projects. And those that were not state-owned entities or those that were not selling uranium as a byproduct of something else was, was a big chunk of the market. And they were pure play uranium mines. So... They needed, you needed to account for the all-in sustaining cost, not just what it costs to produce it at the mine. So when I did all that, I just kind of thought, wow, the, at the price of uranium, 17, 18, 20, 21 dollars, it costs a lot more than closer to 50 dollars, mid 40s to pull it out of the ground. And there were no supply cuts and just thought at some point in time, supply response would happen. And we started to see that throughout 2017. And then we started Sachem Cove in the, uh, May of 2018, because kind of decided at that point that there was a lot of ancient symmetry here. The price of uranium needed to, to if, the, if the cost is in the 40s, close, uh, approaching 50, you got to have a lot higher than that. And here you are in the 20s, low 20s, something's got to give. And that's where the asymmetry came from. Now, that was before there was a 180 uh on the demand side where, uh, you know, those top five producing countries are now going the other way. They, 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 there's bipartisan support for nuclear power. There's policies supporting nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, you know, really still the upside in, in, in the story. Yeah. And thank you for that background. I love how you came at it from the perspective of a short seller saying, mm -hmm. Hey, how can I debunk this? bullish yeah. uranium thesis and it actually made you more bullish there was no i had no dog in the hunt it didn't matter to me i just had some time and i said let me see what if, if there's a story here and you know the, the the main thrust of the bear case at the time was well, nuclear is going away when did solar going to take take over and you know alternative energy that's just not possible i mean wind and solar can grow and it has grown it's been it's been added over 20 years and it's three percent of the you know energy of the power production in the world, right? So um, it's, there's a role for it, but on a mass scale, it, it, it's not ready for prime time and won't be for some time. So it was just kind of didn't make sense. So how would you describe the current state of the uranium market today with those supply and demand um, dynamics at play? I would say there's, um, there's a, for, for many years to come, unless you see significant price responses, which I think ultimately you will. Mm -hmm. But there's a structural deficit. And I, when, when I say structural deficit, I mean understanding what this market is. This market is characterized over cycles by long-term contracting that you know, something like 80, 85% of all uranium sold is done via contracts that, ex that are five, six, seven, 10 plus year range, mm -hmm. not in the spot market. Um, because these utilities, there's no substitute for this. There's no coal to gas switching. Um, you have a nuclear power plant that you've spent 10, 12, 15, 20 million dollars on. You need uranium. And so they want that security of supply. Uh, uranium as a percentage of the overall cost to run a reactor can be mid to high single digits. As I think about where we are today and I think about st structural deficits, it's when utilities buy and contract at their level of consumption. So they replace what they're consuming. Mm -hmm. And history and understanding history and the numbers is, is very important here because if you look back, you've had a couple of big spikes in uranium. The last one being um, in 2000, the price of uranium was sitting at around seven to $8 in those dollars. And it had been that way for for many years after uh, listeners will remember uh, Chernobyl in the mid 80s. Um, and then people got a little freaked out by nuclear power. 
uh, right? And forget the fact that that Russian reactor was a disaster the way it was built, but it scared people off. And for many years, you saw utilities living off of uh, the, the growth of nuclear power post Chernobyl really slowed down. You had excess inventories. And from like 1993 up until about 2004, utilities were replacing about a third of what they were consuming. And so if you're, if you think about it, if you're replacing a third of what you're consuming, by definition, you're drawing down inventories elsewhere. So they were not replacing it. They were drawing down inventories until you got to about 2000 and, uh, 2005, where in 2005, you started to see um, a very significant increase in the amount of pounds that were contracted. And, um, you know, to put some context around it, if they were contracting at 40, 50, 60 million pounds a year, uh, on, on at that time, 160 to 170 ish million pounds of demand, something like that. Um, they were contracting at let's say 40, 50, 60 million pounds. In 2005, they started, they contracted 240 million pounds. And then from 05 through 2012, even though Fukushima was 2011, for the most part, you were well north of annual consumption. They were contracting at 110 to 130 ish percent of annual consumption. So what they were doing was not only capturing what they were using, replacing it, but they were building back inventories. Um, so, uh, and, and interestingly, and, we, and, and understanding the history, like I said, is pretty important. In that last cycle, the, the, the price was sitting at around seven, eight, nine bucks in 2000. And then by December of, or I'm sorry, by about October of 2006, it was in the high 40s. So you had had a price spike of almost 7x by then, right? So that's a big move. Um, Yet the contracting cycle started in 05. Uh, and if you were to listen to narratives, and this is what's it's pretty important um, if to focus on math and not narratives, right? Because narratives have a way of being molded to fit a, a certain outcome or story that people think happened or want mm -hmm. to have happened or will happen. But the math typically, which is not very, well, uranium math can be a little tricky, but, but math is math. Um, if you look back at that time, uh, what, what the narrative today and back then uh, to the narrative today for that prior period was, well, the world's largest mine was scheduled to come online in 2007, which is owned by Cameco. It's called Cigar Lake. It was scheduled to bring on 18 million pounds per year, and it was scheduled to come in in, in 07. And at that time, uh, the it flooded. There were a couple of minor floods, but a bigger flood in October of 06. And um, that today's narrative would be that kicked off a contracting cycle. Well, no, it didn't. The contracting cycle started in 05 with 240 million pounds, which was significantly greater than consumption versus the 40, 50, 60 million pounds. Mm -hmm. Price had already risen 7x by the time you got there. And in, in, o, in October of 06. And if you were a nuclear fuel buyer and you were looking at the consensus forecast at the time, the day before, the week before, the month before, the Cigar Lake flooded and it was known that this is not going to come online for many years. If you looked out about six years into the future and you said, okay, I'm a, I'm a fuel buyer, I buy in five, six, seven years out, what does it look like six years out? You would have seen, based on the, the consensus forecast at the time, there was a surplus in the market of about 125 million pounds. Now the flood comes in October and then you move forward to 2000. Let's take the first quarter of 07. And what did the consensus numbers look like? After the world knows that the largest mine in the world is going to be delayed for many years, what do the next six years look like looking forward? you would have seen a deficit of about 225 million pounds. So while the world's largest mine scheduled to come online at 18 million pounds a year wasn't coming online, the, the surpluses that showed in the market forecast actually almost doubled because 
uh, the forecasters look, found some what they thought could be new pounds that come online. They, they thought maybe some demand comes uh, uh, off a little bit, but they showed surpluses. Yet the price of uranium went from $49, $50. At one point, it spiked up to $137 very briefly with contracts being signed in the 80s and 90s, but the spot market at $137. And that was with a surplus in the market. If you did math and your job is to look and I buy fuel, let me look at what the forecast show. You saw surplus. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to today. If you recall, I mentioned that from 93 to 04, the third ish was being replaced. Today, uh, if we go post Fukushima from 2012 through 2021, you would have seen about 37 percent of annual contracts being uh, contract uh, of annual consumption being contracted for. And so, like I said earlier, that means their inventories are being drawn down. So you've had this drawdown, this drawdown, this drawdown. But if I look today into the future and I say, what's it going to look like by 2030? It's 2023 right now. Mm -hmm. um, even the forecasters, the consensus numbers, the industry consultant, the lead industry consultant who will go nameless um, would would he, they even show a deficit, a mild deficit? And we, we completely disagree with their work, but we, we but they're not, not a surplus of hundreds of millions of pounds, but a deficit. Um, and so, and on top of that, there are a couple of things that are very different about this cycle than last cycle. In, in the last cycle, when prices were spiking, mm -hmm. you had two sources of supply uh, that you don't have today. Uh, it, from a growth perspective. Back then, uh, you had something called the megatons to megawatts program. So in 1993 to 2013, there was a cooperation program between the U.S. and the, and the former Soviet Union, whereby the U.S. would uh, take the, the, so, uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, Russia would, and, and Russia and satellites would downblend what amounted to about 1,600 intercontinental ballistic nuclear warheads and take the highly enriched uranium, down blend them to low enriched uranium, which can be used for civilian nuclear power and send that into the United States. And that was something along the order of 18 to 22 million pounds per year from 93 to 2013. Wow. Now the U S consumed anywhere from 45 to 50 million pounds per year. And they still do. So if you think about it, they had what looked like, it could have been 30, 40, 40, uh, 45 percent of their uranium that was coming in was coming in from a source of supply that were like um, pounds that were just going to appear. So they didn't have to worry about, oh, do I have to make sure that these, there's enough uh, uh, produced uranium? Can these mines produce uranium? That was a nice off balance sheet source of known supply. It's coming in. Mm. We're going to get it. And that's it. That doesn't exist today. The other thing that existed at the time was the rapid and unforeseen growth, unpredicted growth by the forecasters of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan today is 41% of global uranium supply. Back then it was a very small, but it was a single digit percentage player. And so these, the growth came out of nowhere and they started putting pounds in the market. Well, today there, there is no megatons to megawatts program that doesn't exist. And there is no new Kazakhstan on the horizon, and yet you're facing a deficit. So utilities are now, last year they contracted at, at 60, 65% of annual consumption. Um, we think that that's already surpassed that um, now. And here we are in just the beginning of August. So the difference between last cycle and this cycle is, is last cycle, there was a surplus in the market and prices went bonkers. Uh, this cycle, there is not a surplus. There's a structural deficit. Um, and when you start looking at that marginal pound, that's going to satisfy that marginal uh, de demand. You know, your, your prices need to get, we think now into the, well into the eighties and nineties. And by the way, last cycle, they needed to get into the sixties and they went to 137 for a brief moment, which is 198, $200 in today's dollars. Um, but again, surplus last cycle, this cycle, that surplus doesn't exist. Um, and that marginal pound needs a lot higher than it did last time. So it's going to be very interesting to see um, where this, how this plays out. We're, 
we're very constructive on where it, on how it plays out. And you mentioned a couple times that buyers are purchasing 65% of annual consumption. Can you just define that for myself and the audience, what that sure, actually means? Sure. So it's their replacement rate. So if you use a pound from, from 1993 to 2004, they were replacing about a third of a pound, right? So they're sucking down inventories for the balance, wherever, either their own or they're pulling it out from others or buying it from others. But for... Um, 2005 through 2012, if they consumed a pound, they were buying 1.1 uh, pound, 1.2 pounds, 1.3 pounds. Why? Because the cupboards ran bare and they had to replace. Not only did they need to contract for what they were consuming, but they needed to replace the cupboards. They needed to stock up. It's a, it's a restocking. Same thing's happening here. From 2012 on down, it was a destocking period. Consump contracting, if they used a pound, they were replacing uh, 0.37 of a pound, roughly. Right. Okay. So similar to the last cycle. Now you're getting this last year, they replaced 0.65 or so of a pound. So what they're doing is they're <laughs> They, they draw down inventories, the utilities do. Mm -hmm. and, and so inventory levels matter. Um, but if you were to look at inventory levels now around the world, in the United States, typically the U.S. is comfortable at two years-ish inventory, um, the utilities. Mm -hmm. Europeans around three-ish years. Um, and when you look at those levels now in the U.S., they're below two years and a little bit and below in Europe. Uh, but there's, there's another element to all of this, Ryan, and it's the geopolitical risks that are involved. If you look about where uranium is produced and where it's consumed, there's a mismatch. Something along the lines of 70% of it is consumed in the West, mm -hmm. but 70% of it is produced in the East. So there's that geopolitical misalignment. And if you think about the market shares, it's Kazakhstan at 41% uh, of uranium produced. Um, that includes some joint ventures with a few Western uh, players. Um, it includes joint ventures with Russia. Um, but, but Kazakhstan, the route to get uranium out to the world is through St. Petersburg. Russia is the primary route. Uh, they have a secondary route they're trying to make work through the Trans-Caspian, um, but it's a tough neighborhood, right? So we've got what we, Russia, if we think about the nuclear fuel cycle, and this might be a time to briefly just touch on what that is. Maybe before we dive into that, I'd love to see if you can quantify some of the metrics around what estimated inventory inventory levels are, and sure. then also what estimated annual consumption is for uranium, and maybe break yeah. that down for us. Sure, yeah. So. Annual consumption, it's going to depend because a pound of uranium isn't a pound of uranium from a consumptive purpose, and it has to do with the nuclear fuel cycle. So the nuclear fuel cycle uh, is, it starts out, it gets, comes out of the ground, um, uh, and uh, there's U-235, there's two isotopes, U-235, U-238. U-235 uh, has 0.7% uh, 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 is, is U-235 is 0.7% energy content. The U-238 is 99.7%. Uh, the U-238 is not part of the fission process. The U-235 is. So you need to get that up to about a 4 to 5% enrichment level uh, for it to be able to be used in, in nuclear power, civilian nuclear power. That's called low enriched uranium. If you're looking to make a bomb, it's got to be up to 90% plus. So the way it works is it comes out of the ground. They crush it into a powder form. It's called yellow cake. Yellow cake that gets sent off to a conversion facility, and it gets converted into uh, a gas called uranium hexafluoride, known as UF6. UF6 then gets sent off to an enrichment plant where the... Uh, isotopes, the U-235 and the U-238 are separated in what are really rapidly spinning, uh, very fast spinning centrifuges. Uh, and um, those that, that they're cascades, there's a, a various, uh, many, many centrifuges lined up one after the other. And, and 
the enrichment process is called a separative work unit. It's a unit of work. That's the measured unit. So a SWU is what it's known as. Um, it then goes from there. It gets sent off to a uh, fabrication plant to be put into uh, fabricated fuel rods that get sent off to the reactor. Um, so um, that's, that's what your nuclear fuel cycle uh, looks like. Um, when it's at the enrichment stage, though, if you think about uh, the unit, enrichment is basically force and feed, force being pressure the, or the amount of work that's being done and feed being the feedstock, right? The UF6 that's going in there. And if you think about uh, capacity plays a very big role in how much is being used. If you think about an apple press and you want to get cider out of that apple press, well, you put a bushel of apples in and you squeeze on it, you're going to get a certain amount out. If I have too, too much capacity, I don't need as many apples. I just keep pressing on it, pressing on it, pressing on it, and I'm going to get that gallon. If I have too little capacity, I add more apples and I'm going to, to add that that's UF6. That's the amount of uranium uh, hexafluoride, which starts off as uranium uh, before it's converted. Depending on the enrichment capacity around the world um, depends how much UF6 goes into the centrifuges. And so for when after Fukushima, there was a lot of extra capacity because Japan was 13% of nuclear power generation and all those reactors went offline. So everything got backed up in the system. Well, fast forward to today, and there is not enough uh, separative work unit capacity. And a lot, some of that is, or a chunk of that is geopolitically aligned because Russia uh, is over 40% of world enrichment capacity. And so all of a sudden, that goes the way of the dodo bird. It goes by, mm -hmm. right? So now the Western enrichers need to add capacity, which takes years to do. It also takes much higher prices to do. It, you need to incentivize the Western enrichers to go back and, and add capacity. And so, so in the interim, as Russian enrichment capacity is, is self-sanctioned off from Western utilities, they're self-sanctioning away from that. How do you get that capacity that's available? How do you get the finished, the enriched uranium product? Well, using the apple press an analogy, you add more uranium, you overfeed. And so you're overfeeding the, the, the centrifuges, the separative work units, and that, that is providing. So in, in a given year, like in, when there was too much capacity, you know, they, the, the, the amount of natural uranium that was needed to produce the same amount of enriched uranium product was less. And, and you could see a swing here to put it in context, Ryan, when there's underfeeding taking place and there's too much excess capacity and they don't need as much natural uranium. Mm -hmm. We saw the Western world produce 20 million pounds uh, uh, less uranium, uh, pr produced the same amount of uranium for the reactors, but they needed 20 million pounds less uranium, natural uranium. Today, uh, it's, it's along the lines of 20 million more pounds that they'll need. So you could look at it like a 40 million pound swing in uranium. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as you look about how many pounds, we start asking, well, how many pounds of uranium? You know, it depends. And, and, and the number that they'll use, and I don't want to get into a technical discussion on, on the technicality of enrichment, but it's, it's the tails, it's the waste stream that, that determines that. Um, uh, and and de depending on the, the tails that they use, the, per the percent tails that they use will determine how much uranium is in. Suffice to say where we are now, um, there's going to be, there's not enough capacity, there's going to be more uranium needed. And so if you look at what's going to need over the through 2030, it is not unreasonable to assume using uh, tails that are elevated from where they've been based to, to meet the needs of the reactors that you're looking at uh, north of 200 million pounds of demand for those reactors uh, without giving away what we think it is, but it's just suffice it to say it's north of 200 million pounds. Um, and, then, and then you have to, so that's, but that's reactor requirements. 
then you start to have to look at a couple of other things. Number one is there's this concept I talked about before of restock, destocking and restocking, right? So destocking in a contracting cycle, if we use the last cycle as an analog, you know, you're looking at over this period of time, about 10, 15% above their annual requirements because they're destocking what they had let the cupboards run dry on. So if you're looking at a 200 million pound number, you know, people should do their own work and figure out what they, they want to use 1.05, 1.10, 1.15 for, for these times, but it's, it's something. And it's, mm -hmm. so you're looking at pick a number, uh, 10, 15, 20 million pounds. And then you're also looking at uh, on top of the 200. And then you're also looking at um, secondary players in the market right? Uh, the, uh, the Sprott vehicle, the yellow cake vehicle, there are hedge funds coming into the space. There are sovereign wealth funds that are starting to buy physical uranium. So you're starting to look at, you know, no, you start to get nicely into the 200 plus million pounds, way, way into 200 million plus pounds of, of uranium demand. And again, everyone needs to do their own work and figure that out. Um, from an in, in, in inventory standpoint, you know, there are there's total inventories and then there's mobile inventories. How much can we really access? The total inventories include depleted uranium, strategic stockpiles with this, the Russians and the Chinese and the Americans, uh, Europe, everyone has their strategic stockpiles. How many of those pounds are depleted? When I first started, one of the things that caused, that catalyzed me to say, I need to do more work here was in 2017, I went to a nuclear power conference um, uh, the, uh, held by the World Nuclear Association. And it was just, you know, it's a big event. And I had the good fortune of being invited to a small dinner with a bunch of large nuclear fuel buyers. And at that time, one of the industry bellwether consulting firms came out and said that uh, there was 1.4 billion pounds of inventory. And I looked at that report and um, I read the report and I thought, huh, well, that's interesting because they're framing it as though it's 1.4 billion pounds of inventory, but but a lot, a bunch is depleted, a bunch of strategic stockpiles. When you start going through it all and teasing out all the numbers, it was like, I don't know, um, five, 600 million pounds are mobile that can be accessed. And at that point, you use 180 million pounds. So you're like, okay, well, there's three to four years of inventory. The West, the U.S. is comfortable with two. The Europeans are comfortable with three. Okay, so there's a little bit of inventory that needs to be worked out more, but we're getting towards the end. 1.4 billion is not relevant. Those are never going to see the light of day. They're uneconomic to, to re-enrich them. They're strategic um, as you go country by country. But at that nuclear conference, I had the good fortune of being invited uh, by a, a, a foreign producer to dinner with some of these fuel buyers. And I had just come off of studying this, this inventory report, which I thought was, was inaccurately portrayed, the, the amount of inventory levels. And when I asked these fuel buyers, I said, what about inventory? They said, well, what about inventory? They said, There's, you know, so we use 160, 170 million pounds, something like that, 180 million pounds, depending on the year. Going back then, they said, um, you know, if you saw that report, there's eight to 10 years of inventory out there. And I said, you know, yeah, but you don't, like you don't believe like that. That's not relevant. You, those aren't real pounds that you think you're going to access. You're like, what are you talking about? Now the price of uranium at that time is 17, 18, 19, 20 bucks. They're like, we can get all the ha our hands on all the uranium we want forever at $20, $25, no more than that. I'm like, yeah, but you, I, I, I'm just curious. You, you really think that the, you're not looking at the strategic level, the depleted level, the economics involved. And they're like, well, look, there's plenty of uranium out there. Now, now keep in mind, from 2011 through when Fukushima happened through 2017, all they saw was prices just keep going down and down mm -hmm. and down and down. So there was a recency bias that was permeating their thinking. And I asked them, I said, let me ask you a question. How do you guys get paid? And they were like, oh, you know, what? Well, that, that's obnoxious. I'm like, no, I'm not asking you how much money you make. I'm asking you, what's your incentive? Right. Go back to Charlie Munger. Show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. Um, how do you get paid? Well, what do you mean? They, they, they didn't even resonate. What do you mean? How do we get paid? I said, if you had a really ambitious fuel buyer 
that did their own supply demand work and came to you and said, prices are 20 bucks. We need to buy all the uranium we can because they need to get to in the 60s. Would you buy all the uranium you can and do they get compensated? And is it part of your compensation? Are you bonus for that? They looked at me like I had three eyeballs. They said, what are you talking about? We're, we're paid to, 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 to buy uranium. Whatever the price is, we're going to pay, but we're not going to pay more. I said, so the commerciality of it, you just take some industry forecaster uh, whose sole reason for being is because utilities pay for, you, pay for their stuff. But you're going to take some industry forecaster's word. You're just going to all sit there and do it, but there's no, no, no economic incentive to do otherwise. And again, it, they thought I was a moron. And so mm -hmm. that to me, uh, I remember going home and thinking about on the way home, like, these are uneconomic, not that they're, they're very bright, they're nuclear, they're nuclear engineers, but they don't have the financial incentive. It does, they don't get paid for it. And they're not incentivized to do it. They're incentivized to secure supply. Whatever so that price is, as I, as I said earlier, it's a small portion of it. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of that. So from an inventory standpoint, now, even the industry forecaster who, uh, the main industry forecaster, we have had great disagreements with, we've publicly called them out many times. And to their credit, we're, we're one of the very few financial hedge funds that are subscribers or mutual funds to them. So it's mainly a utility driven product. But mm -hmm. But to their credit, we give them a we're behind the scenes. We're busting their chops day in and day out, pretty regularly, a lot. Um, and they stand there and they're very, you know, that we, we for years we've disagreed with their work. Now they've done a 180 and they're pounding the table bullish. And they're talking about inventories uh, overhang is gone. That period is gone. And so when you think about the number, you know, you've got to, people need to go in the U.S. There's an annual marketing report that's put out there. Uh, the European uh, put out, Euratom puts out a marketing report. And those are, like I said, in the U.S., it's below two years. They're comfortable at two. Europe's a little around three or below if they're comfortable around three. But people need to really understand. So, so they're below typical levels. And then you could go through the Japanese inventories and you, you, you know, they're starting to restart now. So they're at very comfortable levels. But you need to do your own work, though. And you need to think about and have history. As I said earlier, the megatons to megawatts program existed. So, and I said Kazakhstan was just starting to grow. Well, that, that has a real impact today because those programs aren't there. So if I'm looking at the EIA annual marketing report, and if I, if I read it, the EIA puts out the uranium marketing report, and I read it, I, I, the number's like 102 million pounds of inventory this year, something like 100 million pounds, something like that. Um, and it, so it will, it will show utility inventory and then it will show supplier inventory, right? Oftentimes when people wanted to tell a narrative, they would just show you re utility inventories, which were high in 2016, 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't show supplier inventory, which was materially higher than it was in the prior cycle. So when you balance them out, they were kind of around each other, but when you look at them now, though, what you have to add back to that, which never does, if you're laying out on an Excel spreadsheet, a, a, a bar graph, a bar chart, that megatons to megawatts program, go to 2013 and work yourselves backwards um, to, to 2004 and five and all those years where there was 20 million pounds coming in. So in 20, 2004, 2005, again, fuel buyers buying in, uh, uranium Mm -hmm. They're looking at the forecast, but they also know there's though addi those additional pounds besides the normal supply coming in. And then it's material, it's, it's much, much lower than it is uh, now than it was then. Um, but you just got to think about it. But even not using that, they're mm -hmm. still at levels that are very, very comfortable. But then you get back to what I said earlier, how many, how many pounds can be sold? And I say that. Uh, Use for a sold for a dollar. If every state owned entity decided they were going to sell for it, which they're not. I mean, they sell it. The current market prices may be a little bit less, but you're at, you're at, you're, you know, you're not even maybe around half the market, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little depending on, on the year and the demand and whatnot and how much supplies coming online. So, and then you get into those secondary supplies. Now, that's where, you know, the industry forecaster, the main one that, that the sell side tends to cut and paste from, not all, but they, they're getting better at it, the sell side being the investment banks. 
But when, you know, for many years, the, the sell side would take that forecast and just use it. And if you look at that forecast that comes out of the, the industry forecaster, um, it's, a, it's here's, here's the supply, here's the demand, right? There's either a surplus or a deficit. The balance, if there's a deficit, gets filled by something, it, probably inventory, but inventory has a price, right? So if you think about the bottom here, the bottom in the uranium was $17 in late 2016, right? But if you were to look at the, the, the way the forecasts were laid out and the way that the way they laid out is they, they use something called inventory drawdowns as a balancing mechanism. So if, 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 it's not laid out on one sheet. There, you got to tease through many reports, but it's all the supply, existing supply, new mine supply, and secondary supply, and then demand. And then you look and you say, okay, well, some years, you know, it's it's some years it's it's close to being balanced, a little bit surplus, a little bit demand. But then you look at the inventory drawdown numbers, and inventory drawdown numbers, which were like you go back to 2016, 2017 looking at what the forecasts for the years 2018, 19, 20, 21 were, and you would have seen inventory drawdowns, and I'm ballparking here. I don't have the model staring in front of me, but yeah, 8, 10, 12 million pounds. Now, they, they don't have a place in a supply-demand model. That, that's for the market to determine, right? It's there's a shortage or there's a surplus. If there's a shortage and utilities need to go in and buy uranium, the market price will determine where it balances out. That's not how the, the, the industry shows their numbers. So it's not a commercial creature. So what it does is as you look at it, like I said, 2016, 2017, they're showing eight, 10, 12 million pounds of drawdowns in the future. As you get to 2020 and 2021, those drawdown numbers become 30, 40, 50, 60 million pounds, right? And that's how they balance the market without a price associated with that. The reason the prices have tripled is because there's been a call on available inventories. What is out there? We need inventories. There's another player. There's Sprott comes into the market. We need some inventory. Well, that has a price with it. And that's not the way this market is laid, is forecasted. And it's it, it plays to the advantage of investors, ultimately. But in the meantime, you talk to fuel buyers along the way over the years. They've like, got plenty of inventory. Okay, okay, well, great. In 2017, you told me that, that prices were 17, 18 bucks, 19, 20 bucks. Uh, I saw you saw you a couple of times, spoke to you a few times throughout the year. And, and at 25 and 30, you said there was plenty of inventory. Got it. Um, saw you the next year, spoke to you a few times, met you at the conferences, had a beer. At 35, $38, you told me there was all the inventory you could buy. Got it. And you told me that's 17. And now at, the, at another conference, we do some phone calls. You see each other. You had another beer. Then you said that there's all the uranium you could buy at $45, at $50. And now I just met you at another conference and you just told me that you're signing contracts with $80 ceilings, $85 ceilings and, and $55 floors, but there's plenty of uranium out there. Explain to me how that works. The price is more than tripled. You could have had floors and you could have had contracts with ceilings in it at $35. Now you're paying $85, but there's plenty of uranium out there. So it's, um, it's somewhat comical, um, the, the way the industry numbers are presented. But again, it all accrues to the benefit of investors who understand how the cycle works, who understand the commerciality of the buyer of the cohort, who understand the way the sausage is made on the, on the forecasting side, right? So there's different elements to it that you've got to wrap your head around. Um, mm -hmm. So where we are now, Inventories are what we would characterize as below normal. Um, contracting is starting to heat up. Geopolitical risk, I, I, I go back to say, right, like Kazakhstan had a, a civil uprising in January of 22, uh, followed by a Ukraine-Russian war. Uh, Russia is 14% of uranium supply, 28% of conversion supply, and in the mid-40s of enrichment supply. Move them to the side. You've got a lot of replacing of supply that you need to do. 70% is consumed in the West, 70% is produced in the East. There's, there's a, a, an immense misalignment. Um, you know, we, uh, I was public in 2017, 2018. In 2017, I gave a talk somewhere that's out there that talked about the geopolitical 
uh, chess that was being played by the Russians. And I couldn't believe, like the United States, to put it for context, the United States consumes round up 50 million pounds a year of uranium. <clears throat> Back in uh, 19, uh, early 1980s, they produced 44 to 46 million pounds of uranium, pretty much self-sufficient. And you would think so for something that is so critical, the nuclear Navy uh, is, is, uses uranium, um, mm -hmm. but the nuclear power fleet where there is no substitute we were mainly self-sufficient. Fast forward to 2020, by 2022, there were basically no pounds being produced and half was coming in from Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. And it, as far back as 2017, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but something's gotta give here. So there's this realignment taking place. And if you look back at last cycle, you know, I mentioned 05 was the first major contracting cycle, but 01, 02, 03, there were little things that started to take place. A misshipment, there was a fire at a mine. There was a little little things that take place that start to, in the, in the fuel cycle, start to create some uneasiness. And then all of a sudden, somebody buys a big contract. Someone else then goes by, and then they realize that they're ch stepping over each other. You yeah. fast forward to today, you start to see those little series of events starting to lead the big series of events like the Russia-Ukraine war, which has turned the fuel cycle upside down. Conversion, I mentioned. I mentioned SWU has gone from 35 to 150. Conversion was $4 per kilogram up to $40 per kilogram. Wow. So you've seen these huge moves. The way the fuel buyers tend to go after contracting, Ryan, is they need to first make sure the fuel is in the fabricated fuel rods. That's the very last touch point then they make sure that their enrichment conversion is secure. Then they go to conversion, uh, enrichment capacity. Then they go to conversion and then they go to uranium. Why uranium last on that? Because there's only a few in, uh, fabricators. There's uh, only three or four enrichers. The same thing with the converters. And there's you know a handful more. There's more mines than that. But the, the, the price needs to be a lot higher uranium wise to be economic to meet the demands of the utilities so it sounds a bit like a perfect storm where you can kind of see the storm roller coming and buyers are really not incentivized in any way to try and get in front of that because they're not compensated by saving money and uranium is such a small input to the total cost of running a reactor that they'll just pay whatever price they they need to pay at the time right. by the sounds of it yeah so what's the what's the bear case for the uranium yeah. bull thesis yeah, no, there's, there's, you know, there's always things you have to worry about. And every day you come in thinking, where am I wrong? Um, you know, so there are things like, uh, you'll see there, there's bear cases and then there's fake bear cases, but fake bear cases affect stock prices, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some of the things you think about is uh, Kazakhstan's 41% of, uh, of global production, uh, we think that they're more challenged now than not to grow that production. Um, uh, but, you know, they they flex their muscle once in a while as they've been very disciplined with supply cuts. They cut 20% at one point below what their targeted goals were. Um, but, you know, we also think from over the years, the analysis we've done and, and the many conversations we've had that um, they've, pulled out of the ground higher, the, the more high grading than not. Um, mm -hmm. We think it co will cost them a lot of money to grow that, but they can pound their chest a little bit sometimes and flex up and say, we're going to produce this because they don't like to see everyone else saying we're going to produce a mine. They, they're competitive. So you, you can see that, uh, you know, we think China, which is a, a significant portion of the growth in nuclear reactor builds, um, if China were to pull back on that, that would that would hurt the, the bull case. We've seen nothing of the sorts. We've only seen full steam ahead there. And these are long life projects. You just got another bunch approved just in the last month. Um, all signs point to very strong growth. We're seeing it in the, how they behave. They're buying uranium in the in the in, in the fuel cycle. If you live in there, you know that they're they're net buyers of uranium. Um, you know, they're they're. Uh, they, they hold a, a few hundred million pounds of uranium in reserve, and people would look at that and say, oh, they're just going to flood the market. I, I mean, they're not looking in terms of, of five, seven, ten years worth of supply. If all signs point to them, they play a different game than we do, than the West does. They play a long game. 
They're looking at multiple decades of, of supply, 50, 75, 100 years, and they're in there buying. Um, so, uh, you know, you look at that, you look at um, uh, if, if, if you were to, you, you had, I don't, it, it's, it's difficult, but if new mines were to uh, uh, pop out of the uh, ground and, and, and uh, they were to take uh, pricing, that would be uh, not very economical, be, but it'd be hard for them to get the financing to do that, right? So who's going to give them the debt package if they're, if they're not committed to certain contracts at certain prices? Um, you know, we, we look at some of, some of the uh, uh, producers have, so, uh, have bought uranium over the last couple of years at very good prices, not a lot of uranium, you know, a handful of million pounds. Um, if, if they were to, it, it, and it's not a bear case, but could they sell a few hundred thousand to a million pounds or half a million pounds where temporarily short term it could hit the spot price? noise. Um, it, and if, if anything sold off on that, it'd be a great buying opportunity. Um, but structurally, you know, and obviously can a reactor melt. If you get another reactor meltdown, it, all bets are off. Um, because, right. you know, what happens then these things get cut in half, right? It's just kind of the nature, the risk that you take in that stuff. Um, you know, we look at, we're always looking at, are there other major new projects that are coming and, and we don't see anything. Um, uh, but you know, you're always, you never know what tomorrow brings, but we don't see anything now. Um, uh, you know, people look at, uh, people will look at next gen, which has the arrow project, which could produce 25, 28 million pounds per year. And, you know, that they'll look at it without really having done the math and say, and say, uh, Oh, well, that can really hurt it. They bring it online. They're going to pump the market. Well, that mine can be brought online in different stages and modularly and it's economic and different. So, you know, that, that's a responsible producer. And again, you got to, that's the other thing. When you're looking at these projects, there's, a, you know, a lot of junior producers out there. And I, I'm not talking about next gen's got a timeline, but that's some years away that it, it comes online and mm -hmm. who knows what happens there, right? That's a strategic asset. It's a big asset. Who knows if they ever bring it into production, if they ever bring it into production, who knows who else is out there that might want that, um, right. that might not want it to go into production. There's a lot of things that, Take what you realize looking over the years, forecasted projects that actually come into production are very, very rare. There's a lot of junior miners jumping up and down saying that they're going to bring them into production. Yeah. But, you know, you just look recently, you've got this, the, the coup d'etat in this year, um, where one of the companies was supposed to, you know, full steam ahead, we're bringing on a mine. Maybe they do, um, you know, up to 4 million pounds a year. Um, well, they don't have the debt package. They don't have the financing package. There's a coup d'etat in country. The stock's gotten pounded. How's that going to happen at any timeline that looks like it? It's probably yeah. challenged. Um, not saying that it eventually won't be, but what winds up happening is these timelines keep getting pushed out um, and prices need to go up. Uh, so, you know, these new projects that are out there, when you look at many of them, uh, they're not going to be coming in at the at the timeline they say they are or the prices they say that they can bring them on. Um, you know, so also, you know, you, so you're, you're always looking, you, you look at um, uh, some of the, some of the physical holding vehicles, some of the hedge funds that might come into the space. Do they sell some uranium? We don't think they do. Um, they're by mandate. That's not what their mandate is. Right. But you're always trying to think of what's out there in left field. Yep. Um, so, so again, it's, and, and you, on, on the flip side, like I said, when I started really doing the work here in 2016, it was, there was really very little political support. What support there was, was more Republican in the U.S. than, than Democrat, right? So it was more right, right wing than left wing. Um, uh, but, but now you've got bipartisan support. Um, so if you saw for whatever reason, some support get pulled, but boy, there's a lot of momentum on the other side. Um, Absolutely. So really, it's it's some new discovery you hadn't thought about. Some country, it's some new discovery in some state owned in some state owned uh, in some in some state owned uranium producer that they could bring online right away. That's that's very disruptive. We just don't see it out there. And what's the best way to get exposure to the space? Would you take a look at miners or just yeah. buy the actual physical product through the Sprout vehicle, for example? Sure, that's a good question. It depends on what somebody's risk appetite is, right? So. 
if you think about the mine, just the mining space, there are explorers, there's developers, and then there's producers. Um, there's just a very few number of ways to play the production side of things um, publicly. Um, and then you look at the developers, and there's a fair amount of developers. Um, you know, everyone claims to have the lowest cost, and they're going to go in. So you really have to do your homework on the production costs, on what's in the when was the last technical report done. Are they accounting for the effects of mining inflation, of general inflation? Are they leaving money on the table with what price they claim? Can they even get it done at those prices? But there are, you know, there's a reasonable number of developers that people can take a look at. And then, of course, there's a big swath of explorers all around the world that are looking for the next great uranium deposit. More speculative. Um, you know, uh, it depends on, on how comfortable somebody is in believing whether or not there's something there or not. Um, so they just have to do the work on that. You know, those are where your people, you know, can have bigger dreams and aspirations and hit it big or not, right? They could be yeah. zeros or moonshots. So it's, you know, and you got to be buyer beware. You got to be careful in that, it says in that space. So you, you, there's ways to do that. Then there's the physical uranium. Um, that you can buy through Sprott or, or Yellow Cake investment vehicle. If you're in Europe, you can buy it through uh, Curzon's new vehicle um, that has a physical vehicle. You can't buy that in the U.S. But those vehicles, when uh, you know the Sprott vehicle, when it trades at a premium to, to NAV, they'll issue equity, and they they bought up a lot of pounds. They they cleared out some of the, the spare pounds on the spot market. Um, but you're seeing now they they've been trading at a discount for most of the year. And the price of uranium has still gone up very nicely. So they're not necessary in the market. It's a nice have. If, you, if they're there and issuing and raising, it's awesome. But without them, that's fine too. Um, uh, and there are now some physical funds. Cause there are some hedge funds that are starting to uh, look at the space. Um, you know, the, the, the appeal of it is if you do the work, you realize the price of uranium has to rise nicely uh, and you, you don't have mining risk so something that's very appealing to some people right on well mike i learned a whole bunch this episode and you really tied the pieces between when we had mark nelson on the show and then we had doomberg on the show yeah so i encourage our listeners right. to take a look at those as well to yeah. get a full picture yes. but mike this was fantastic and thank you so much for your time today. thanks ryan it was my pleasure i really appreciate it